I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about amphetamine-induced psychosis. What is amphetamine-induced psychosis? So this is a state of psychosis, and I'll explain a little bit more what that is, that is induced or brought about by taking amphetamines, and I am including street amphetamines here, including cocaine and methamphetamine and prescription stimulant products, including focus primarily on Adderall, the mixture of dextroamphetamine salts, dextro and amphetamine salts, and or dexedrine. How much this applies to other stimulants like Ritalin-based products, I will also be talking about. Psychosis is a loosening of connections to reality. The amphetamine-induced psychosis in particular is characterized by hyperactivity. People are walking around in an agitated physically state, shaking, tremoring, talking really fast. Usually sleep is particularly inhibited. And some people have called this state of amphetamine-induced mania, because it looks like again, someone's energetic, talking fast, talking rapidly. I prefer the term amphetamine-induced psychosis because the Every single case that I have seen, and I've seen a few dozen, involves intense states of paranoia where someone is suspicious that friends, family, random strangers around them are plotting against them, doing evil things, have nefarious, and not just our garden variety conspiracy theories. I have not seen any of the grandiosity, elevated, happy, exaggerated, silly mood. I've just seen fear, anxiety. So, to begin with, I'll sort of put this in the framework. I've been to dozens of lectures by ADHD experts, and when they talk about the risks of stimulant medications, what they'll usually talk about is the risk of addiction, which we know happens in 2 to 4% of kids and probably a lower rate than adults. They'll talk about the extremely rare risk of sudden cardiac death for the very rare individuals, close to one out of a million, maybe a little more have a genetic predisposition and drop dead. Talk about the common side effects that are usually reflective of just too big a dose of being mildly agitated, dry mouth, appetite suppression, sometimes excessive sweating, sometimes insomnia. And then they'll say, oh, and then there's amphetamine-induced psychosis. This happens about one out of a thousand people. Let's look the other way and not even discuss it. It's so uncommon. And again, I'm exaggerating not much at all. That's how I've heard all the presentations on amphetamine-induced psychosis. The fact that I think most experts and most practitioners are making not much to do about this is when I give a version of my lecture, which I'm going to give in the next 15 minutes, to new patients, even patients who have been on stimulants for a long time, including patients who have been with renowned experts, most of them will say, oh my God, this is new information. Nobody really explained this to me. And often, even in the popular media, the segment that likes to demonize the existence of ADHD or the talking about ADHD or the prescribing for ADHD makes a big to-do about addiction and sort of blurs amphetamine-induced psychosis into addiction when I think they're pretty clearly separable problems. I mean, you can have both of them, but you can certainly have one and not the other. The first thing, this is not just an intoxication state. And by that, I mean most of our substances, including alcohol. If you drink enough of it, you can become really out of it, not aware of what's going on, belligerent, saying all sorts of things, trashing furniture, beating people up. You usually fall asleep, then it wears off. You wake up in the next morning, you may have a hangover, probably have a hangover, but almost certainly you are not belligerently screaming at people out of, have no awareness of where you are, or what you're doing, while the amphetamine-induced Psychosis can start while the drug is still in your system. What's particularly scary about it to me is that the classic pattern is that it persists for days, weeks, sometimes even months or even years without subsequent additional dosing. So this can be an, and that's telling me that at least in these people, we are having a semi permanent or at least a longer term effect than just again in acute intoxication. So that to me, is really scary or worrisome. People should be warned about this before starting stimulants. Second thing, it's the long-term picture. So one thing that's 
surprisingly sad. And yes, rare events are hard to study. But again, given the seriousness of this one, I think our field has been negligent and not studying it enough. So there are very few long-term studies. Most of the data that I've been able to collect has been looking actually more often people concerned about cannabis or alcohol-induced psychoses. Both of those can induce longer-term states. Both of those are used more widely than the stimulants. Of people who present to a hospital with an amphetamine-induced psychosis, the data suggests if you look 10 years out, probably about 20% of those people are in a permanent psychotic schizophrenic-like state. Maybe at 20 years out, 25% of these people. What we don't have data on are these people who continued using, and that's contributed to them falling into this as a permanent state. Some of them, at least presumably, were single-time bad, bad episode. The long-term consequence was they wound up in a permanent psychotic state. None of the studies that I've looked at you know, broke it down to year two, three, four, five how many of them were in this permanent state. Regardless, this is an alarmingly high risk for such a serious, horrible outcome. Lecturers I've heard talking say, oh, this happens about one out of a thousand times. That's not very common. One is, for something this serious, one out of a thousand isn't particularly rare. Rates I've seen have been closer to higher than one out of a hundred, less than one out of ten, but substantially higher than the one out of a thousand risk. So first of all, that one out of a thousand risk has been based not on a lot of large historical data. There have been a few studies in recent years. And one reassuring study, this was done on the whole Swedish population, they looked at Ritalin use, so methylphenidate use, and they did not find any particular increase in psychotic syndromes in a population-wide study in the Scandinavians and general how extremely good records for the whole population. No increased risk from Ritalin methylphenidate. Other studies similar recently have shown rates for amphetamine. So this is Adderall-like products, things like Vyvanse, higher than one out of 1,000 and closer to one out of 400, one out of 500, one out of 600 in the different studies. Again, that's most people will not get this. But again, for such a bad outcome, people need to be warned about this. My own practice is skewed. So part of why I got Aware of this is that, and I just checked my first records of stimulant use going back to 1994. And within the first 22 patients I treated in a few years, first few years of treatment, two of those 22 wound up with amphetamine induced psychoses. They were on dextroamphetamine based products and they were not on excessively high doses. It was so alarming that that's why I've been more attuned to it, but why my practice is skewed. One is, I've worked with a large number of HIV positive men over the years, being having an office in the central part of San Francisco where there's lots of gay men and lots of gay men who had HIV. For those of you who weren't around or don't remember the early stages of the HIV epidemic, this is a virus that does infect the brain. Actually, a third of people presented with symptoms that were psychiatric symptoms, not with opportunistic lung infections, not with Kaposi sarcoma. But a third of presentations with HIV in the early days were psychiatric symptoms. So the virus can hang out in the brain. Presumably, that would make some people more vulnerable to developing a psychosis when exposed to a drug that can trigger that. Clearly, I've had lots of HIV-positive men who did well on stimulants, so I don't think that's a complete contraindication, but it's part of why I think my population is skewed. Secondly, and mostly overlapping with HIV, but Clearly, a separable phenomena is in the gay community. The abuse of street methamphetamine is clearly higher than in the general population. And we do know the available data suggests that both cocaine and methamphetamine, which is chemically distinct from amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, legal amphetamine, methamphetamine, an extra methyl group added on, has substantially higher rates of abuse, substantially higher rates of addiction and substantially higher rates of psychosis. Working with the population that has higher use of MET, and including the very first case of amphetamine-induced psychosis I saw was in a man, clearly he had ADHD. He essentially lied about an episode of MET-induced 
psychosis he had had more than a decade before he started use of what seemed like appropriate use at the time, prescription stimulant use, to treat his ADHD. It actually did treat him successfully. He was finally able to return to college, complete his degree, and get a much more suitable and challenging job. And it was a year into that job, a few years into stimulant, prescription stimulant use to develop full-blown psychosis. Third reason I have probably more than the average practitioner or an elevated rate of seeing amphetamine induced psychosis is that I am identified in databases as insurance based and otherwise as someone who works with ADHD who is willing to prescribe stimulant medications. Fourth point is that many people who've had an episode of this, including being hospitalized, which is hard to get in this day and age, you have to be pretty out of it and pretty dangerous to yourself or others to get in the hospital, even though the state itself, as I've seen, is characterized by fear, anxiety, paranoia, not by joyous mania or exuberant, uplifted spirits. Many of these people want to keep using stimulants. I have received calls from a man, young man in his 20s, who was hospitalized for amphetamine-induced psychosis. He had convinced his inpatient psychiatrist that it was a good idea to treat his ADHD to get back on it. She didn't actually have an outpatient practice, but called me. I had only seen him once before when I prescribed him and he wanted to resume using. A few years back, I saw three different 20-year-old men in the same year who all found my name through insurance or other databases who wanted to get back on stimulants for the ADHD, even though all three of them had had multiple hospitalizations for amphetamine induced psychosis. Two of these individuals clearly lied and tried to hide their past history. And I may be overly concerned. I again see it more than other people have seen it. But I think again it's worth being worried about rather than sort of lazily dismissing it as not very common. Developing evidence that the amphetamine based products are more risk than the riddle and methylphenidate based products. This does not seem to be a particular risk with Stratera, Wellbutrin, some other antidepressants or other medications that can effectively treat ADHD. There's been a lot of commentary and discussion. Pretty clearly, the immediate release forms of our stimulants seem to have higher rates of substance abuse and addiction. There have been claims that the immediate release have higher potential for causing Amphetamine-induced psychosis, I don't know any data that speak to this fact. I mean, it makes sense that if you're reaching higher peak levels or causing more toxicity in dopamine or other catecholamine systems, maybe you're causing more damage. Or maybe the rapidity of big doses coming on and off receptors is a vulnerability. On the other hand, there have been some researchers who said theoretically Maybe our risk is higher with the extended release because we are occupying those receptors at a greater percentage of the time. And again, there does seem to be both a dosage effect in terms of bigger doses seem to be more potent. There were studies going back several decades just looking at healthy volunteers. And if you up the dose of stimulants high enough, a substantial number of individuals will develop an acute psychotic reaction. So that's a well-known phenomena. There's some lifetime exposure risk that's as important as the daily dosage risk. I've certainly treated some people for decades who did stably on amphetamine and Ritalin-based products who have not developed, developed any problems. So what is the treatment approach? First parts of the treatment approach is immediately stop any prescription stimulant use or non-prescription street stimulant use. Two is get on an antipsychotic. I've seen some reports which questioned whether antipsychotics have been effective. In all the cases where I've seen them being used, they appeared to be effective and that the symptoms did resolve within days. My strong recommendation is to stay off stimulants indefinitely. One set of written reports of people who had amphetamine induced psychosis were retried with low dose slow acting Ritalin based products. And again, that possibly may be safe. Again, Ritalin methylphenidate may have no potential for this, but I would 
not feel particularly comfortable myself with that medication out. And I would absolutely certainly never retry anyone on amphetamine Adderall based products. If they had ever had a episode like this. And there's both some laboratory research animal data and some human data that does suggest even having one episode sensitizes the brain and that's more risk for having such a response again. Prevention is the biggest lesson here. And part of my preparation for anyone that I am prescribing Aperol, Ritalin, any stimulant products is to go through a talk somewhat like this, given that part of what's intrinsic in any psychotic process is lack of touch with reality. You can't just tell a person, okay, sit and wait till you're paranoid. But they know they're paranoid. They think it's real. They think that policemen really are under the steps they're spying on them. They think someone is really, mother is poisoning their coffee in the morning. What I tell anybody who's about to receive a prescription like this, you need to tell someone who is in your daily life, either a family member, a spouse, friend, maybe even a coworker, maybe a, a therapist who's seeing you very frequently about stimulants having a potential for risk for this. And if they are seeing any signs of this, they need to tell you to stop and get to emergency medical treatment. So I think prevention is the best recipe. I mean, along those lines, I am very reluctant to prescribe stimulant and again, particularly Adderall-based products to someone who is living alone, not having any interactions with other humans and doesn't have someone in their life who can check up on them and keep things in track and help avert the disaster if we're seeing the early stages of a disaster. Have a happy Halloween. Have a happier election day. Stay safe. 